You know, you're not supposed to keep coming back. I tell you to stay away. Here you are. Look who's back. Oh, didn't see you there. I guess you're back for more crap. Look who's back. I guess you're here for another 15 minutes of incoherent brambling. I've got a brand new pair of Raylar heads behind me. They leave a lot to be desired in the spring pack. Um, they're just a really inexpensive associated spring. The retainers aren't even 10 degree retainers. They're just inexpensive nonsense. The valve locks even are just, again, seven degree, 20 cent a piece valve locks. They're not even hardened machined keepers. So I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, we're going to upgrade this to a nice ISKI valve spring. It'll be a little bit more spring rate, but overall it's just going to be a very long lasting, long wearing part choice. Uh, we're not going to do titanium retainers. We're going to do a very cool tool steel retainer, uh, 10 degree locks. This is all easy, inexpensive parts that you can go out and buy yourself. Now all these concepts that we're going to talk about here uh, apply to any cylinder head you're going to be working on. Whether it's a plain old Honda or a Briggs and Stratton from 1920, a hint at the future there, uh, Porsche, Lamborghini, Ferrari, these concepts still apply. Very simple, very straightforward. So I'm just going to show you some of the things you need to look out for, what to check, and let's get going. Ooh wee. Deceptively cool. Now my last Raylar video was a little controversial maybe not with the regular Jim and Joes of the world but homeboy reached out to us and said he didn't like what I was saying about his cylinder head see I, I did say that they're five thousand dollars they're not they're forty three hundred bucks by the time you've shipped them paid tax put parts in them they're five grand I'm sorry but there's no no real argument there so sorry to irritate you but here we are these things come with these associated springs like I said, nothing fancy. Problem is, the hardware is pretty dinky. Uh, the springs are not known to be the highest quality component known to man. Uh, we're going to be upgrading to a very high quality ISKI valve spring with a tool steel comp retainer. Now, I don't think that Raylar offers an upgraded valve spring for these. I've never witnessed a set of these come in with any other spring than these associated springs. You wanted an upgraded spring for these, you were kind of just left on your own or you'd have to ask them very nicely and the answers you'd get may or may not have been uh, to your liking. The upgrades we're gonna do here are really easy. Uh, a lot of times if you're gonna put a different spring pack in, you'll have to change the valve lengths, but this is going to be relative to you guys that just wanna buy these heads or you bought these heads used and you just wanna change the spring to a better spring. Uh, so we won't even be pulling these valves out of, out of the heads. These are some pretty nice valves. They're SI valves. They make valves for almost anything you could imagine. So if you need valves, guides, seals, whatever, give them a call. Chris and Steve and Pete, they'd be happy to help you out. You can see that things are a little dusty in here. I mean, it's not that big of a deal, but I'd love to see that these heads are a little cleaner. Uh, here's that ISKI tool room spring we're going to switch to. A good sign that you've got a high quality valve spring is that they've, whether or not they've got a chamfer on the inside diameter of the winding. These don't break. I've never seen one of these break. I've seen them lose pressure, uh, but you know, that's pretty ideal. A broken spring will pretty much ruin your day. So now the first thing we're going to have to do is make sure the spring locates properly. You can see right here that the stock locator fits the associated spring quite well, but on the ISKI, it's quite floppy. It's not terrible. Probably let that go, but it's not right by any means. Now switching to the proper locator will ensure that we're not gonna have any valve train issues related to uh, improper location of the valve spring. So here I've got everything swapped over. I did run into an issue when I mocked everything up where the top of the locator did crowd the bottom of the valve stem seal. And you can see these are a special valve stem seal. They're a smaller diameter than what the Raylar heads came with originally. So let's get that seal ripped off. Let's see if I can one hand this. Come on. If you're careful, you won't even damage the valve stem seal. Now the trick is when you've got a square groove lock, 
when you get the seal pulled up to the groove, you're going to pull it to one side, move it past that lip and kind of just pull it past. And hopefully if you're careful, you're not going to tear the inside of the valve stem seal. Nice. Such finesse. Now, this is what I'm talking about. See how the top of that locator is flush with the flange of that valve guide? Whoa, come on, come off. There we go. We're flush with the top of that valve guide. Look at the top of that shoulder. Look at the height there. It's quite short. Now, if I could find my new one. More taller. There you go. Watch what happens when we put this on here. The top of the locator is going to crowd the top of the valve stem seal. Okay. And that is an issue because what will happen is it's going to leave a little air gap between the top of the wiper and the top of the valve guide. And there would be a nice big open area where oil can collect and that can cause an issue. Um, there are some mixed opinions about whether or not that's okay. Uh, I personally have seen a lot of aftermarket heads come with valve stem seals that were being crowded by a big stack of valve spring shims or whatever. And there's a big old like eighth inch gap in this little area here where oil could collect. And I didn't witness any problems. Uh, I have witnessed other cases where that was a problem. I don't really want to risk it. So we need to figure out a good solution to keep this uh, seal from being crowded by the spring pack. Now, your options are cut down the top of the locator. Uh, these are hardened chromoly, uh, and it's actually kind of a pain in the ass to modify your components. That's a great option, but not my number one choice. Now your other option is to take the shim stack out. Come on. And instead of using spring shims to get your spring height, you're just gonna use offset valve locks uh, and you can shrink the, you can move the retainer down towards the spring locator and get the spring height that you want. Uh, that does limit your adjustability and that's not what we're gonna do. Now we're left with the issue of how do you keep the seal from being crowded by the locator. Now these are your options. This is the valve stem seal that these heads came with. This is typical of most cylinder heads. Uh, and this is what we're going to be switching to. Uh, this is a metal clad valve stem seal and it actually doesn't have any rubber viton on the inside. And what that does is it shrinks down the outside diameter of the seal. Um, so that will mean that this locator is actually going to miss the top of this seal dimensionally. And you can see what that looks like on these other heads. Let's see. There you go. Everything just comes right off. This thing will never run into that seal. This is honestly the best option here, in my opinion. The seals are cheap. I don't have to order another $80 set of valve locks. Uh, they're red readily available. For 40 cents each, I'm gonna go with this route. Oh man, my little squirrel brain is losing track of where I am. Check this out. There is that stock Raylar retainer. Everything's lathe turned. You can tell that these are more than likely an offshore product. You know, got to keep a PC here. That's what we're switching to. That is a tool steel retainer. Now the industry is actually moving away from titanium. Uh, the main reason is titanium just doesn't hold up, especially when you're using a spring with a flat wire dampener. Now, I'm told that there's some titanium retainers that'll hold up just fine to a flat wire dampener, but eh, generally we're not going to use the titanium in a street motor. Probably shouldn't be your first choice. Now this tool steel, tough as nails. These will last longer than the engine. Uh, Chromoly, on the other hand, this would be my number two choice. Um, in fact, in most cases, it is my number one choice. I probably wouldn't be using inexpensive ones like this, but you know, 
not a bad retainer, but solely because this has a seven degree taper, we're not gonna use it. Look at the difference in diameter of valve spring. The diameter is kind of just a thing. Um, it's inherent to the type of the valve spring we're going to. I honestly would rather have the smaller valve spring, but for what we're doing, uh, it's going to jump up in outside diameter. It is what it is. Now, let's go back to the retainers. See the difference in diameter here? That seven degree retainer just doesn't have the surface area that the 10 degree retainer is going to have. And that's going to be good for long wearing components. Uh, let's see if I can show this properly on camera. Maybe we can do a little zoomy zoom. Let's see. Whoa, check that out. Now you see at the parting line, notice how it looks almost torn. Um, that's actually because it is torn and these are stamped valve locks. Deceptively, these are black and black will often indicate that the parts have been hardened, but in reality, it's probably just food coloring. Um, these things in the real world don't hold up. Uh, I, these things always are trash whenever I pull these heads apart with uh, any amount of miles. In fact, the, uh, uh, because the grooves aren't very defined, uh, it always causes damage to the keeper grooves of the valves. Whoops, lost it. Oh well, don't care. Let's just throw the other one on the ground. Now, this is what you want to look for. If you've got a high quality valve lock, even if it's just a seven degree, you're gonna see that the parting line looks nice and smooth, it's very flat. That'll indicate that the valve lock has been machined. These types of valve locks are unlikely to roll over the keeper grooves on your valves. Uh, and you know, after you get some runtime, you're actually gonna be able to pull your valves out without having to file the keeper grooves flat again. Um, and that's what's happening whenever you take apart a pair of cylinder heads and you go to pull the valve out and it actually gets stuck on the valve guide because there's a big old burr worn into the keeper groove. Check that out. You see, that's what I'm talking about. Right there, there's a little tiny ding. And you can almost see the raised edge on the corner of this valve. And that's what happens when you use cheap components. That's why we're here. Garbage. Oh, I'm gonna have to wash my hands. I've been handling these heads for about an hour this morning and look at them, filthy. That's a seven degree taper, 10 degree taper. Much more surface area. And that's gonna also act for a steeper wedge and it'll help prevent this keeper from getting pulled through the bottom of the retainer. Uh, Remember, you've got all these crazy forces pushing on each other. Valve spring wants to go there, uh, valve wants to go back down, everything is acting on other things. More surface area is not a bad thing. And the steeper keeper angle will help prevent you from having any real failures. Uh, it's not invincible, but for $5,000, I probably would have expected a nicer component. At this point, you'll have purchased your $4,300 plus tax plus freight cylinder heads. You've gotten them apart. You spent the money on your new springs. Uh, you're going to pull most of your stock hardware off. You're going to take your brand new locators, set them into the cylinder head. Then you'll take one of your brand new retainers, set that on. We're just doing a mock-up right now. Now a pair of your keepers. Pull the retainer hard into the valve locks or into the keeper groove. That'll help keep things nice and engaged. Now if you're like me, you're not gonna use a spring mic. Well, you can, you can also use the tail of your calipers. And what you're gonna wanna do is you're going to find the flat portion of your retainer Grab the retainer with your caliper. Now, once you've got a good measurement, zero it out. And then what you'll do is you'll use the tail of the caliper right back here. And you'll use this portion of the caliper on the top of the retainer. Then you'll run the tail of the caliper down to the spring pad. Um, and then that'll give you your spring height. 
Your other option is to use a spring micrometer. Let me see if I can find one. Man, I very rarely use this thing. It's a little dusty. Your other option is to take a spring micrometer. That will actually just go in place of the valve spring. Uh, it'll go in like so. Your retainer will sit here in that step and you'll actually just wind out the spring micrometer until it engages the valve lock. You'll get it nice and tight and then take a measurement off of your uh, spring micrometer. This is good for you guys that are a little on the beginner side of things. Option three, a little more accessible. This would be your uh, mid-tier option. I'd probably recommend this to the uh, home gamer or maybe if you're a bit of an enthusiast and you might be doing this once or twice. Uh, you can use a pair of snap gauges and your calipers. So I'll show you what that looks like. Let's actually show you what all three of these options will look like in real time. Ooh, very dusty. Okay. It's one valve lock. Come on, go in your home. Go back to where you came from and demonetized. Come on. Okay. Bam. One inch, 965 for all intents and purposes. Very easy. These aren't the most accurate things in the world, but it'll get you pretty close. So now option two is use snap gauges. So we're going to get our locks and retainers put on, get everything pulled into place. So now what I like to do is I'll get everything locked up about where it's gonna go. I'll hold the snap gauge at a slight angle and I'll tighten up on this lock here. So what you'll see is the little anvils here are now locked into place. Now, once you've got your snap gauge locked down, pull your retainer up to about where it's gonna live, and then you're going to just hold it as straight as you can, and then rotate it. And then you'll feel it drag slightly in the middle. If you've done it right, then it should pretty much just stay in the same spot and you'll feel a slight drag when it's parallel with the uh, valve. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. Let's see if this is gonna vary. It, I saw that locator tip a little bit, so it's probably gonna vary. Nope, one inch 960. One inch 961, why don't you shut up? Don't correct me. Now last option, this is really what I do every single day. And there is a feel to it. It's pretty easy to get it wrong. Um, probably wouldn't recommend this unless you're very careful and double and triple check your measurements uh, is to just use the tail of your calipers. Come on, stop, I, urgh, stop falling. Probably should have used some grease. Okay, you're going to zero in your calipers. Okay, one or two thou here and there, not the end of the world. This isn't something where I'm running the spring right up to coil bind. And you're going to pull everything up as tight as you can. Okay. There we go. 1963. So as you can see, those three different methods work pretty well. Uh, do whatever you feel comfortable with and double and triple check your work. This isn't the time, this isn't the step that you're going to want to rush through. Uh, so now what I see here is I've got about 1960 is my height 
as these things sit. So what I'm going to do is add a 15,000 shim and that'll get me to 1945 thereabouts. And then on all the intake valves, I'll be adding the same amount, uh, 15 thousandths of shim, and that'll get me about 1945. I will off camera check every single one. Uh, on the other cylinder head, I did have one odd valve that was about 20,000 steeper than all of the rest, so that one got an extra shim. So don't just assume, unless you're the one that machined it, don't just assume that all the valves are the same height just because the valves are, just because the heads are brand new. Uh, so let's go check the exhaust. And on the other head, uh, on the intake side, I actually pulled all the shims out and then added 45 thousandths of shim, so it had 45 thousandths total. On this head, the intakes are quite a bit deeper and I'll be adding, we'll be running 75 thousandths of shim total. Uh, so I'm curious to see what the exhaust side looks like because on the other head, I didn't touch the shims at all and just ran the heads as is. Uh, huh kind of tells me that there's quite a bit of variance in valve job height from head to head. What's that all about? Okay. Let's give this a shot. Whoa, 1920. Is that right? Did I forget to zero this? No. Come on. 1920. I can't wait to see what the critics say about my tail the caliper method. I've been doing this for about 10 years, so, you know, I've got the feel down on this thing. Strange. So what am I gonna have to do here? Let's pull that 60 out. That'll get me to 1980, so I need to do about a 15,000 shim. So let's add, I have some 20,000 shims. Let's drop a 20,000 shim in there on top of the spring locator and see what happens. Oh, what is this all about? Check this out. What is going on here? These retainers or these locators are black. What is this silver crap? Dude, these heads are full of anti-seas. So that means that uh, when the guides got installed in these heads, uh, they were installed with anti-seize and the, uh, the anti-seize didn't get cleaned off of the heads properly. Yeah, that's exactly what I want inside of my engine. Come on. Wonderful. This is why you check your work, everybody. Okay. Let's see what that's all about. Okay, so I've got a 30,000 shim added to there. Okay. Let's try that out. 1960. basically. Hmm. Do I add another shim and get to 1940? I think I should. So let's try that. This is the exhaust side. A little bit more spring pressure wouldn't hurt. The valves are acting against compression. One nine forty nine, one nine fifty essentially. Okay, so just for a sense of sanity, let's try out the spring mic, just so I can prove to you guys that I'm not exactly a complete idiot. Bam! This isn't even a fancy spring mic; it's one off of Scamazon. Okay. Just go until it's snug, perfect. Stop shaking. 
for all intents and purposes, that's 19945. Basically the same. And I am sure that the snap gauge would confirm my beliefs. So I'm only mostly correct here. The valve job heights from head to head only vary about 15 thousandths from one head to the other. Uh, it's not the end of the world. I'd like to see it tighter, but what can you do? Okay. Let's get that pulled nice and snug. Bam. Let's see what that says. And then 58. We're all in the same realm. Perfect. I can live with that. People, uh, I don't really recommend the snap gauge method. We did this for years, but probably the most accurate method would be using an actual spring mic, but I don't get to use this very often. It doesn't fit a lot of the uh, springs that I tend to use. After you've got your shimming worked out, you're going to grab your valve stem seals. Remember, these are special seals and they don't have any rubber on the inside. Uh, so you can't just push them on by hand. You'll actually have to tap these on with a hammer. Before you do anything, you've got to pull this little spring off. That way you don't damage it when the seal gets driven onto the valve guide. Once that's off, you can use a seal installer or a nice 12 point socket that'll fit around this rubber and push on the metal jacket. Um, a wrist pin works as well as long as it's a nice straight and flat tool. Um, I'll be using a 12 point socket, works just fine for me. And then I'll just tap this down until I feel the seal bottom out on the valve guide. Uh, once you bottom out on the valve guide, don't give it an extra tap, just stop. That extra tap will tend to uh, set the seal loose and then it'll come free while the engine's running. Uh, if you get this wrong, uh, there's no way to get the seal back off without hurting it, so take your time. Oh look, I didn't know that this would work, but that's my special socket from the Ferrari video, so this is all machined flat, so we'll actually just use this. S some people put Loctite on the inside of the seal, I think that's a pretty bad idea. Uh, don't do that. So, push it down, pull out your hammer of your choice, got this nice snappy one. There we go, simple as that, bottomed out. You'll deform that rubber just a little bit, but it's rubber, it'll spring back. It's Viton, it'll spring back. So, after your seal is installed, I'll check that out. After it's installed, get a good look at it. Make sure that it's on straight. There's no air gaps on either side of the guide. Find your spring. Hopefully you didn't drop it on the ground. Oh, I just flicked it across the room, everybody. Of course I did. Might be why they call it a spring. Not like I don't have extras. Bam. Get your spring put back on. There you go. Just like that. Let's try this one more time. Okay. Pull your seal off. There you go. Get everything pushed back down. Take your socket, might help to twist it. Light taps, doesn't take much. Get a look at that, it's on straight. You can literally just grab them. If you grab it and it moves, you got to pull it back off. It's going to be a problem. Okay. Seals are installed. Let's get the rest of this head converted over. Uh, I'll do that off camera. 
before you get to this stage, you're going to want to do one last check, and that's going to be measure your retainer to seal clearance. I can see with my own eyes there's plenty of clearance, but on some cylinder heads, you're going to run into issues where you might have so much cam lift that you actually might risk uh, the bottom of the retainer hitting the top of the valve stem seal. Uh, the Generally about 50 thousandths, 60 thousandths of retainer to seal clearance is plenty of clearance. Um, we're going to have, I, I want to say, more than 250, 300 thousandths of clearance before we might run into any amount of uh, retainer to seal issues. So just like everything else, you're just going to take your retainer and a pair of locks, get everything pulled up into place. Look at that. That's like 900 thousandths. And you're going to hold everything together. Yep. About 930 thousandths. Plenty of room. Uh, the camshaft will only have 670 thousandths of, of uh, valve lift. Plenty of room there, not a concern at all. Um, on stock 8.1 heads, people really freak out about retainer to seal clearance. And I see people on Facebook and on the forums all the time talking about all these special parts that you need to run and how you can't run X amount of valve lift because you'll hit the valve stem seal, blah, 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 blah. It's all wrong. Uh, it, if you're not changing the valve length on an 8.1 head, just a regular old GM 8.1 head, uh, then what you need to do is you need to run a plus 50 valve lock and then deal with the shimming of the valve spring. And then any of the cams that you'll be running on a stock bottom end 8.1, you'll have plenty of room using a plus 50 valve lock uh, to get the retainer to seal. Um, any cam that's larger where you'll get into issues again, you're gonna run into piston and valve issues. It's not a problem, but there's a lot of bad information floating around out there. It's probably why there's so many uh, misconceptions about the 8.1 platform. So in addition to the retainer to seal clearance, uh, setting up your spring heights, now you're gonna actually take that spring height number that you were going for uh, and you're going to set it up into a spring tester. If you don't have one of these, which if you're just some dude at home, you're probably not going to have one. Uh, reach out to your local machine shop. Every machine shop is going to have one. If this thing is actually filthy and you can't even read the numbers off of the, uh, off of the dial, run away. That's a red flag. They don't use that machine. Always check your springs. I know what these pressures are going to come out at. Uh, they're about 165 pounds seated and like 470, 475 open. In some cases, you'll want a lighter valve spring. Other cases, you'll want a heavier valve spring. It really depends on your camshaft and what it requires. Flat tap it stuff. You're not going to go over about 340 pounds uh, unless it's some kind of NASCAR deal or some kind of thing that's got a bunch of fancy components. But, you know, flat tap it stuff, about 340 max. If it's a stalker deal, probably don't even want your flat tap it spring pressures over 240 to 280. Hydraulic roller stuff, you're going to be anywhere from uh, 340 pounds open all the way up to almost 500 pounds open. Generally, you'll be about 380 to 420 pounds open. Um, always pick the right spring for your application. If you get this part wrong, you, again, you'll scatter an engine or you're not going to make power. You're not going to uh, keep your valve train in control. A lot of bad things can happen here. This is really why uh, cylinder heads are their own practice in themselves. Um, and this honestly is kind of a mystery to a lot of people. Import people especially. They always just want to run the heaviest, uh, most expensive springs that they can find. And generally, that's not going to work. Consult your local engine builder. Consult your cam manufacturer. See what, uh, see what they recommend for you. So... I know my installed height is about 1940 to 1950, so let's call out uh, 1945. So, a couple ways you can do this. Since you have a dual spring, you're always going to have to measure it with your retainer. 
unless for some reason you don't have an inner step and the retainer is completely, completely flat. Uh, but I've never seen that before. You're always going to have it in an inner step because your inner spring calls for a different height than the outer spring. So you're going to take your retainer and either measure the overall height from the top of the, from the bottom of the outer step to the top of the retainer, or you're going to actually just uh, set up your caliper for your spring installed height. So we're going to go 1945 here, just splitting the difference. Perfect. Close enough. Um, and I'm going to run the spring tester down until I get to 1945 with the calipers right next to it. Um, and then I'll bring the retainer down until the bottom of the retainer comes in flush with the, with the top of the calipers. Um, another way to do it is to use the scale on the side. Uh, that'll get you pretty close. A lot of aftermarket setups for the spring testers will come with a dial indicator and you can use that to determine whatever your spring is being pulled down to. More modern spring testers like the Buxton Engineering one um, is going to be completely digital. There are other ones like Performance Trends and whatever that are all digital and it'll do all this measuring for you. Let's get this pulled down to the side. See if I can do this. Yeah, I can do this. Okay, let's go 1940. Come on. These are supposed to be bolted to the bench. Okay, it's 1940. So I can see 165 pounds. Perfect. So now from here, what I like to do is I like to zero out the calipers and then take that number and go to whatever the valve lift number is going to be. Let's get it to 670 exactly. Perfect. So now I've got it set to the valve lift number. We'll get this pulled down. It's going to be a little hard, but the number that I, uh, the pressure that I measured earlier was, uh, about 475 pounds open. This camera's in my way. And this is quite dangerous. Maybe we'll make a video on attaching this to a table or something. Come on. Oh. Okay, let's pull it just a little past. That's easier, I can handle that. There we go. Okay. Each of these increments is five pounds, so we're at uh, one. We're at four seventy-five. Look at that. There's a glare in the way. Wonderful. But four seventy-five. Bam! I just dinged up my knob. Wouldn't be my first time. Now another thing that you're going to have to check is the coil bind number. Uh, that's very important, especially if you're running a spring that's uh, right at the limit. A lot of times you're going to want to run it pretty close to the coil bind number anyways, because that's actually really good for the coils and it helps uh, keep the springs from getting into a two way uh, harmonic. Now, pretty much all spring manufacturers are going to supply you with a coil bind height number. Uh, if you don't have that number on hand or you don't know where your springs came from, maybe you're working on some used heads. All you got to do is take your retainer. Make, uh, to make sure that you've got the right step for your inner spring. Uh, put it into a vise or uh, any manner to use any manner to compress the spring safely, by the way. Um, compress a spring until your coils touch each other. Uh, when they touch, don't keep on cranking. Uh, just stop once they've lightly touched each other. Uh, and then you're going to measure the height from the top of the, top of the spring to the bottom of the spring. Whatever that number is, that's your coil bind number. Uh, on these particular springs, that number is one inch, 180. Uh, then you can take your closed height measurement, uh, subtract that from your lift number to determine your open height measurement, and then 
subtract those numbers from each other and then you'll get the uh, distance to coil bind. So I've got these measurements written down right here uh, for the railer heads with these ISKI springs. One inch, 945. That's my closed height. That's what we set up at the beginning of the video. Uh, I subtracted 670 thousandths from that number and that gave me my open uh, height on my valve spring. So that number is one inch, 275. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna subtract your closed height number from your open height number. So one inch, 945 minus one inch, 275 uh, gives us the distance to coil bind, which is 95 thousandths to coil bind. Um, I'd like that number ideally to be closer to 50 thousandths, uh, but 95 thousandths, I can live with that for how generic and lazy the lobes are on this thing. So simple math, not a big deal. And I had high hopes that this would be a nice short video by the time I was finished, but there was actually quite a bit to unload here. But as you can tell, it's really not a whole lot that goes into setting up the valve springs. Just be careful, take your time, carefully select your components, do your research, make sure you know what you're putting into your cylinder heads before you buy the parts. Uh, that'll just save you a lot of headache. Um, and double and triple check your measurements. At the end of the day, we're all out here to have fun. Make sure that you use the right components for your heads. Don't ask your engine to do something that it doesn't want to do. And well, this might be painfully obvious, but if something seems off, engine doesn't seem happy, or it's even making a noise, don't just keep pressing that loud pedal. Maybe pull over and get a ride home. Engine's probably trying to tell you something. So everybody, enjoy your week. This is just a random bonus video since I was doing something fun here. Uh, this is Josh at Engine Rehab. Thanks for watching. Uh, this was the longest 15 minute video ever. So hopefully you stuck around. Appreciate it. I'll see you guys next time. Maybe we'll do another uh, video by the weekend. And that thing's coming up. Ooh, unobtainium. Thanks for watching.